Hello everyone and welcome back to Mossy Bottom, my homestead here in County Sligo in the west of Ireland, where I've been growing lots of vegetables and some fruit, uh, with varying success I have to say, for six years now. But what do I think are the five easiest things to grow at home or on a homestead, at least in a temperate climate like mine? And how do I eat them? People often ask me in the comments how I cook my homegrown produce. And honestly, uh, I have been quite reluctant in the past to uh, reveal my dietary secrets because the truth is I am a terrible cook. I'm much more green fingered than uh, uh, whatever the cooking equivalent is. And I have a very, very simple palate. But I do love food. I don't get any less pleasure from it than anyone else. I just like simple meals made with simple ingredients. And perhaps there are people like me out there too, you never know. So in that spirit, today I'm gonna to take those top five homegrown crops from my own garden, all organic, and because of that, I believe much sweeter and more flavoursome than if they were store-bought. And I'm gonna cook my favourite thing with each. Don't expect haute cuisine folks or exotic flavours, uh, but definitely easy to make seasonal food with no fancy ingredients from your own garden. Right, let's get started. I can feel my stomach rumbling already. And incidentally, these beauties are for my pigs. So at number five on my list of easiest things to grow at home, we have beetroot, also known as beets. And there are many different shapes, sizes, and types of beetroot, and there are many different ways to cook them. I remember staying on a farm near Williams Lake in British Columbia in Canada, where every lunch we'd have the shoots and leaves of beets just like these, uh, fried in butter, and it was delicious. From field to belly within an hour, just how it should be. And I do frequently eat them like that too here at Mossy Bottom, uh, except I use olive oil instead of butter. But the recipe I'm gonna show you today is for something I've mentioned in previous videos and uh, had a few comments about too, and that's beetroot spätzle, which is a German dish consisting of flour, eggs, and you guessed it, beetroot. Introduced to me by a volunteer who later became my partner. Yes, for anyone uh, who hasn't visited my website, I do now have a partner. And she's a much better cook than I am, I must say. Okay, let's add these to my basket. At number four on my list of easiest things to grow, we have parsley and basil. I'm sort of cheating with this one, so you get two for the price of one. Parsley is technically easier in cooler climates. For basil, being a Mediterranean plant, you need a tad more heat. So a greenhouse or a polytunnel like mine, or just a windowsill in your home. And be sure to choose a variety of basil suited to your climate. I always grow British basil, just because it copes better with the slightly cooler Irish summers. The great thing about both these plants is that they don't require much space to grow, making them perfect for pots, and in the case of basil, you get the extra pleasure of that incredible and unique aroma, making it, I think, a great addition to a sunny windowsill or even a conservatory. I mentioned parsley in my winter veg video because being biennial, it can survive right through a mild winter and then will shoot again the following year, giving two years crop for the work of one. It doesn't get much easier than that. And another reason I put these two together is because I like to make the same thing with both, and that's pesto. I know basil is the traditional herb for pesto and it works really well, um, but parsley does too. Stay tuned because I'm gonna make both and do a taste comparison later in this video. So that's my basil and parsley harvested, but incidentally, I've also heard you can make pesto with these nasturtiums. If anyone's tried it, I'd love to know what your thoughts were down in the comments. This video is sponsored by NordVPN, without which I couldn't possibly watch all my favorite cooking shows on BBC iPlayer. Watch out, Jamie Oliver, I'm coming to get you. NordVPN allows you to route all your internet data through any of their 5,400 plus servers in 60 different countries around the world. Meaning, yes, you can watch BBC iPlayer wherever you are. Or Netflix, 
Amazon Prime uh, and HBO as they appear in the US, if that's your preference, or indeed any other region locked service. You can connect up to six devices at a time, be it your phone, PC, laptop, tablet, uh, Android smart TV, and even in some cases, your router. It's fast, NordVPN is rated as the fastest VPN out there. It's simple, install the app, then with a single click, you're up and running. No technical knowledge is required. And most importantly, it's safe. Uh, unlike most unsecured internet connections, NordVPN will block malware and malicious ads from accessing your browser, prevent your IP from being tracked, and make it much safer to make online transactions. That's why I started using NordVPN over eight years ago now, and why I still use it today. If you want to find out more, then follow the link at the top of the description to get a two-year plan with an exclusive deal plus one month free. And it's risk-free with NordVPN's 30-day money-back guarantee. Thank you to Nord for sponsoring my channel. I don't think you like peas, Moss. At number three on my list of easiest things to grow at home or on a small holding, of course, like mine, is, you knew this one was coming, folks, the humble spud or potato. And believe it or not, it's the second week in July now, and I still have potatoes left from last year's crop in storage, and that's what I'll be cooking with today. Uh, even though I've been eating them daily, as of most of my volunteers, since last August when I began harvesting them. It was an incredible crop last year. I'm not too sure if this year's will be as good. We had quite a cool wet June here in Ireland, so they haven't grown as much as I expected. Still looking pretty good though. And this year I decided to exclusively grow Sarpo Mira potatoes after trialling them last year and basically not getting any blight for the first time in six years. And they taste pretty good too, a lot like Maris Pipers. Come on, let's go. So this is my potato crop, or what remains of it at least, from last year. There's a few more boxes like this. And as you can clearly see, they've all started to shoot for several months now and they're quite soft to touch. But there's no mold and no sign of parasites or damage to the skin. And when you peel and cook up these beauties, they still taste really good. So don't be put off when your stored potatoes go a bit like this. But what is my favorite way to cook potatoes? Well, come on, you can bake them, boil them, mash them, fry them. You can even make bread from them, so I'm told. But I am an Englishman at heart, and my absolute favorite thing to make with these, though it is definitely a rare treat, I have to tell you, is homemade chips. And I'm not talking about potato chips in the American sense, as in crisps, as we would call them in Britain. I'm talking about chips as in fish and chips, the English version of French fries. Much bigger, thicker, chunkier, and I think tastier. I don't have a deep fat fryer here, so I make them the old fashioned way. Again, stay tuned for that later in the video. Next on my list, and the second easiest thing I think to grow at home is this, spinach. And I think spinach is probably the single tastiest leaf crop that you can grow. It's sweet and it doesn't have that slightly bitter aftertaste, which brassicas can have for some people. It's also more versatile than something like lettuce. You can cook with it as well as eat it raw in salads or sandwiches. And it's very fast growing. It's pretty much always the first thing I harvest uh, from my spring seedlings, about six to eight weeks after sowing those seeds. And that's really quick, especially compared to other crops. There is one caveat though with spinach, and that's that it does tend to bolt or go to seed very quickly too, especially if the temperature is too warm. So what I like to do is first plant some in my tunnel, which I'm harvesting from April or May, then plant some in my raised beds, which crops a bit later and you can see them behind me, then plant a third batch, this batch, outside with my summer crop, which I'm harvesting later still. In other words, staggering your spinach crop is a good idea. Otherwise, you'll get a mass of leaves all at once. And then when it decides it's going to seed, that's it. The good thing in the polytunnel is that that early crop of spinach now needs to come out and it can be replaced, as you can see I'm doing here, 
by my sweet peppers, which will continue growing right through the later summer and autumn, giving me two crops in the same bed in one season. As for what I make with spinach, well, uh, the truth is I eat it in all sorts of things, but the ultimate self-sufficient meal on my homestead is definitely Spanish omelette, and that's what I'm going to make today. Ah, finally, the easiest thing to grow at home or on a homestead, according to my rather arbitrary list at least, is these currants. Uh, in this case, black currants, but I also have red currants and white currants growing here. This is quite a young bush, but already prolifically yielding. And this is the very same fruit which Ribena is made out of, my drink of choice as a wee lad. I'd knock that stuff back like there was no tomorrow. Why, I hear you ask, are these currants top of my list in terms of easiness? Yes, I could have chosen these lovelies, strawberries, and that would have been a good opportunity to mention my homemade strawberry wine yet again. Go check out that video if you haven't already, folks. But the truth is, I put a lot of work into growing and maintaining my strawberry crop every year, and almost no work into my current crop. Because once you've taken your cuttings, and planted them, apart from mulching once or twice a year, and even that isn't necessary, and uh, pruning very occasionally, you don't really have to do anything to grow currants. They're very easy indeed. The biggest job with currants, here you can see one of my more mature red currant bushes, is actually harvesting them. But at least you can eat half of them while you do. Mm. It takes a while, but my goodness, they are delicious. And what do you make with all those currants, I hear you ask? Well, lots of things. Cordial, uh, sorbet, yes, homegrown ice cream is a thing. And I frequently throw them into salads and savory dishes too, to add a kind of sharp flavor, which I love. But today I'm gonna make good old fashioned red currant jam, one of my favorites. Could be here sometime, folks. You might want to go make a cuppa. Whew. Okay, everyone, we have our bounty and I've retreated now into the cabin because frankly my caravan doesn't have anything like the space needed to make five things at once. Nor does this cabin really, uh, but at least there's a workspace, so I'll give it a try. First up we have the beetroot spätzle. And uh, to make beetroot spätzle, step one is to clean and boil your beets until they're soft, which takes about 30 minutes. Once boiled, you can peel them, cut them into pieces, and puree them with a mixer. Now, this is my haul of eggs for today, all gathered from my own chickens, of course. Some still warm, believe it or not. We're gonna add two eggs, 200 grams of plain flour, and a quarter of a stock cube. Then mix it all up really well, and as you do this, it should start to become quite sticky. Have it folks, our finished Spätzle mix. Ready to cook. Now stick a pan of water on to boil and get out your Spätzle maker. If you don't have a Spätzle maker then despair and wish you bought one prior to doing all that other stuff. If you do have one like me then rejoice and use it something like this. When the little nuggets float to the surface, they are cooked. That's when you know it's ready. Mm. 
What does it taste like though, I hear you ask? Well, if I could find a fork, I'd do a quick taste test for you. Very hot at the moment. Mm. Very hard to describe because it's not really like anything else I've had. Sort of like pasta, but much softer. And a bit more eggy, I would say. Very good. Mm. Next we have our parsley and our basil, which I've washed. Ready to make, of course, homemade pesto. Pesto really is such an easy thing to make, providing you've got one of these, a mixer of some description. Although I don't have an oven at Mossy Bottom, six years and counting without an oven, I do have a mixer. So here we go. Next, you need to add some cheese. And uh, Parmesan is what those Italians like to use. Um, but you can use soft cheese as well, it just won't store as well, it'll taste as good though. Um, this is vegan cheese, a little bit pricier, probably about 50 cent more than the Parmesan equivalent, um, but much more ethical. Slice it, dice it, and add it in. Now for the nuts. You'll need another 50 grams, and the tradition of course is pine nuts, but they're very expensive and come from a very far away land. Uh, I've made pesto with walnuts before, very successfully, but I prefer to use these, good old hazelnuts. Uh, because I grow cob nut trees and I can harvest these, I can also collect them from wild hazelnut trees, if I can get there before the squirrels do. Being local, it's always better, both in terms of taste and for the planet, I think. Next, a bit of this stuff, garlic powder. I'm not a big fan of garlic, as anyone who watches this channel will know. Uh, so I only add a wee bit, but you can add as much or as little as suits your taste buds. Uh, and yes, you can also use the real thing if you prefer. Lots of seasoning, salt and pepper go next. A bit of lemon juice, and I will of course be using the rest of this lemon for that red currant jam later on. And a whole lot of this, olive oil. And I have tried making pesto with sunflower oil and I think rapeseed oil once, and very quickly realized it was an error of judgment. Many things can be substituted when making pesto. Um, the olive oil, for me at least, is not one of them. So you want to add about 150 mil. And that's it. You just have to mix it really well now and then Add a bit more salt, a bit more garlic, a bit more oil, depending on your taste. <sighs> Helps if you put the blade in the mixer. Time for a taste test. You have to have plenty of those. Mm. Definitely needs more oil. Maybe a bit more salt, but not too much. Personally, I like quite a thick pesto. I like it to be really cheesy and uh, nutty and herby tasting. Don't like it to be too liquidy or gooey. This is just right for me. Oh, I could just eat it, just like that. <laughs> it doesn't even need to be added to anything. But of course, the best way to serve it, I think, is with pasta. It might even work, you never know, with spätzle. So that's my basil pesto made, next to do exactly the same thing with the parsley, and then have that taste comparison. Right, so we have the basil pesto on the right here, and the parsley pesto. It's a much more vibrant green. I don't know if the camera will pick that up, but it is a different colour on the left. I'm going to do a taste test now and uh, I've already tasted quite a bit of both, I have to admit, but I'm gonna do another taste test and try and decide which I like best, starting with the basil. Oh, 
Okay. <laughs> I feel like I'm on Master Chef right now. Now the parsley. I definitely prefer the parsley. The basil one is really nice too. Um, the difference is that the parsley pesto is stronger. The parsley flavour uh, is that much stronger and it really comes through. It's probably not as aromatic, it doesn't um, tickle the, the sense of smell quite as, as much as the basil one, but in terms of taste it's definitely stronger. I think I prefer that. If you added loads of garlic to the basil one that would probably make up for, for that difference, but for me the basil one's just it's delicious, it's absolutely delicious, but not quite as good as the parsley pesto. Okay, potatoes washed. Now for those homemade English style chips I promised you. And these couldn't be much easier to make as you will see, but there are two reasons I don't make them very often. One, they use an awful lot of oil, and two, they're very unhealthy compared to boiled, mashed or baked potatoes. Chips are definitely a treat, in my book at least. The good thing is I can reuse the oil and eventually I mix it in with the pig's oats and it becomes a delicious and quite calorific meal and definitely a treat too for them. Right, let's get peeling. You want long potatoes for making chips, which thankfully I've got a lot of. Once peeled, you want to cut them into nice, thick, chunky chips, no French fries. <laughs> and a chip also is not a wedge. They don't look the same, they don't taste the same either. And this is where sunflower oil does come in handy. You don't really want to waste olive oil on something like this, especially as the health benefits are said to be lost when olive oil is cooked. About half of this pan on a medium heat uh, until it's very, very hot. Okay, the oil's hot. In go my chips now for about 10 minutes. You want them to be soft and cooked through, but not crisp. Um, be very careful placing them in. Some people use a sieve or something like that um, because the oil will spit. And once you've cooked them for about 10 minutes, take them out, let them cool, and that gives you time to cook another batch. So my first batch has come out, it's had 10 minutes. I'm gonna let the oil get back up to heat and I'm gonna add my second batch. In the meantime, these are going to cool. They are, of course, not ready yet, but the principle here is to cut them twice. That's what makes them really tasty. Okay, so batch two is now cooling. Batch one is going to go back in again. This time I'm going to cut them until they're golden and crispy on the outside, but not too crispy. So there you have it, folks. Twice cooked. English style chunky chips. One of my favorite things in life. All they need now is a bit of salt. Yum. So next we have my spinach, which as you can see, I've stripped off the stalks and put in this pan. But to make that Spanish omelet, we're also gonna use more potatoes and more eggs and some chives too, which I picked earlier. And all of which, of course, are from my homestead. In fact, the only thing in this meal, Spanish omelette, that isn't is the olive oil and seasoning. And I aim for my dinner every day to be what I call a 60% meal, meaning it's about two thirds home produced. There'll be the odd 30% meal once or twice in a week, but also the odd 90% meal. And this Spanish omelette is my favorite of those. It really does make me so happy to know that I'm eating a full meal that I've grown pretty much entirely myself. Let's get going. So we have our potatoes. This is very much a sense of deja vu, isn't it? I've been here before. <laughs> First peel and then, this is the difference, thinly slice the potatoes and then fry them in a frying pan until soft and beginning to crisp in some olive oil. Remember to season well and uh, I've never worked off quantities for Spanish omelette. I've made it so many times. In truth, there aren't really any hard and fast rules, I don't think. Uh, just work with what you've got, basically. These two potatoes are going to be enough for me. Put 
turn the heat down a bit because I don't want them to cook quickly and then burn on one side. I want a nice even cook and I'm going to put the lid on too. And while your potatoes are frying away, you want to briefly boil your spinach um, only for a couple of minutes, literally just to soften it up. Next, drain your spinach and uh, then use it along with the chives cut up to cover the potatoes. And I'm going to leave that for another 10 minutes or so to cook away on a slightly lower heat. So next I'm going to whisk up another four or five of my eggs, uh, depending on how many people you intend to feed. Uh, or potentially how much cholesterol you're prepared to take. And I'm going to spread the resulting mixed egg over the spinach and chives. Now if I had a grill I would fry for another five minutes then stick that under the grill for five or ten minutes more until crisp on the surface. Uh, but I don't have a grill so I'm just going to keep frying away with the lid on for about another ten. As long as the egg's cooked it'll taste delicious. There you have it folks, one Spanish omelette. Ah, I wish I could sit down and eat it right now, but alas, I've got some jam to make. <laughs> so we've had our lunch, spätzle with pesto, easy for me to say, our mid-afternoon snack, homemade chips, our dinner, Spanish omelette, now it's time for dessert, jam. Yeah, I probably should have opted for that sorbet, shouldn't I? <laughs> anyway. First thing to do when making jam is sterilize your jars and lids because otherwise it will not last very long. Then boil your currants. I've got about 300 grams or so. Um, once it reaches boiling, leave it for about five minutes or so until uh, the currants become pulpy. I'm actually using my masher now to just oh, release some of that liquid in the currants um, and help them reach that kind of jam pulpy consistency. Next add your sugar and tradition would dictate about um, 100 grams of the sweet stuff for every 120 grams of pulp. Um, yeah that's a lot of sugar. It does work with less than that, about half that. Uh, it's obviously just not as sweet. Um, but you definitely still need lots of sugar so time to add it. So next after the sugar I'm going to add a generous squeeze of lemon juice, actually about half a lemon. And then I'm going to simmer until it's all dissolved, stirring constantly. Now once that's dissolved you want to boil hard for about 10 minutes to thicken and that's the key to making it thicken. You can optionally add pectin uh, or something that contains pectin like cooking apples and that guarantees a thicker consistency. Although you can't really buy pectin easily in supermarkets, you can purchase it online. And considering how long it lasts, in my case about six years and counting, it is very economical. But I'm learning how to make jam without using pectin. So today we're going to try the method of just boiling it hard for 10 minutes and see if that works. Okay folks, that's my 10 minutes up. Once cooled, I'm going to add the jam mixture to my sterilized jars, in which it should last for at least three months, hopefully six, though I've never actually tested that because mine always gets eaten in about one week by me. <laughs> of course, you can also make strawberry jam, raspberry jam, gooseberry jam, I've got loads of gooseberries right now, uh, rhubarb jam, and many other types of jam, including combinations of those things. It's something you can really have fun with. The one thing they all have in common is being far more delicious than the jam that you would buy in the store, that is for sure. And there you have it folks, I am exhausted, but that's five homegrown crops turned into five home-cooked meals or parts of meals in a single day. <laughs> and now if you'll excuse me, me and Moss have some serious eating to do. Thank you for watching, subscribing and supporting my endeavours here in the west of Ireland. 
Don't forget to like and post a comment if you have any suggestions for future videos that you would like to see from me and from Moss and from all this delicious food, which alas, I cannot share with you. What a pity. Take care and bye for now. Yum. Moss dog. Mmm. You like chips, don't you, Moss? Especially homemade ones. Home to call our own will work as another day. Home.